Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 school board meeting. We're so thankful to have those of you in attendance and those who are watching at home. Um, roll call, Madam Secretary. Thank you. Please rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, there is no public comment tonight, so we will move into consent items. Um, consent items include the personnel report, claims, payroll, and minutes of the regular session June 27th uh, meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve consent? Thank you, Ms. Williams. Is there any a second? second? Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Is there any discussion? Okay. We'll not take a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries four to zero. We have a special announcement. Um, and I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Ostreich down there because uh, when you did the consent agenda, we uh, hired our, our newest assistant principal. So, Dr. O, take it away. Dr. Beresford, President Browning, members of the board, good evening. And I'm very excited to announce that Mrs. Allie Lewis is our new assistant principal at Carmel Elementary School. Allie has served as instructional coach at Carmel Elementary School for the past six years and in that time has proven to be a compassionate, dedicated, and innovative leader. She has served three school districts in her career spanning rural, urban, and suburban settings. She has taught nearly every elementary grade level in her nine years of teaching and has also served as an instructional coach for an additional 11 years. Allie earned her undergraduate from Ball State University and her master's degree in education administration from Butler University. Uh, one of Allie's colleagues shared with us uh, from Carmel Elementary and said, I am so grateful for Allie and her constant light and guidance. She spreads joy and positivity not only to me, but to our entire school. Allie has children that attend Carmel Clay Schools, and she is here tonight with her husband, Jeff. Thank you for joining her. Congratulations once again to Mrs. Allie Lewis, new assistant principal at Carmel Elementary School. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll now move on to our action items. Um, actions for... 1.1 to 4.5 are change orders. Um, would you, Mr. McMichael? Uh, there, all of these change orders are related to various construction projects that we have, which are, as the board is aware, are funded through uh, our, our bond issues, and uh, we'd recommend your approval for them. Thank you. Do I have a motion to take 4.1 through 4.5 together? Second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, is there any discussion? Mr. Kirshner? Well, I guess first, Roger, I'd like to just thank you for sharing the additional information about the bike racks. Sure. Um, it's exciting that we've got more kids riding their bikes to school and we've got a good place for them to keep them that looks nice. And um, for those that want to see it, they're similar to what are at the new school metal use into the concrete so they look nice that way um, and then I do have one question um, I know we've got up and down change orders but I'm assuming that you know if there was something that ever put us over budget or out of contingency you would point that out to us yes we would uh, yeah if we had any um, concerns or problems about um, something like that that would create a financial problem for us we would share that and also share what solution we had for it Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Any other questions? I just want to say thank you for leading us and getting those set up. Um, you know, driving around and looking at the <laughs> different schools and seeing the bikes everywhere, you know, was one of the things that I was concerned about. So I just want to tell you thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, not just to get my kids to lock it up mm -hmm. and, keep <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and take a helmet. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. All right, we'll now take a vote. All those in favor of approving change orders 4.1 to 4.4. Um, 4. 
please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries four to zero. We will now move on to 4.5. Um, the 2023-2024 and the 2024-2025 Carmel Clay Schools calendar. Dr. Ostrov. Good evening once again. Uh, we recommend that the board approve the 23-24 and 24-25 Carmel Clay Schools calendars as I presented during our last meeting. Um, the biggest change to the calendars are a week-long fall break. Uh, for both uh, school years, and that was uh, came to us after extensively surveying our parents, our teachers, our staff members, who overwhelmingly uh, recommended a week-long fall break. So therefore, uh, at this time, I'd be uh, happy to entertain any questions the board may have. Do I hear a motion to approve the 2023-2024, 2024-2025 Carmel Clay School calendar? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mrs. Jackson. Questions? Mr. Williams, did you have a question? Yes. Okay. Uh, the question would be, is there still any food service that occurs during those times? Thank you. Any food service that... Uh, still occurs during those times even when the children are on break as there is during the summer for relief for people that have food insecurity? I'm going to refer to Mr. McMichael on that question. Thank you. There's not by our food service department. I think there are other arrangements that the school works with you and other entities to okay. recognize that that can be an issue. Okay. And do you think that, that that is something that we could, I mean, closer to the time, make sure is widely published so that yes. people have those opportunities available? Thank Absolutely. You. Any other questions on that? Yeah, just a, a, not a question on this, on these two that are before us, but last time I asked a question about always keeping three years out and so that I thought that the next year we would just come out with one year's further now. I don't know if there's been discussion on that or not. We will we will have discussed it, and we will certainly continue to discuss that um, to bring future calendars, because I know as parents, uh, we want to have those calendars up and ready for planning purposes, so we'll continue to take a look at that. Thank you. I might add, too, that um, this is kind of new. So, um, you know, we're going to use, we'll rely heavily on feedback from year one, uh, but we may bring something back more to you depending on how it's received. Uh, we're anticipating, and, and by the surveying that we did, that it was very positive. And, uh, but you never know until the, you know, the devil's in the details. So we'll see, see how that plays out. Uh, so we will have, we'll be gathering feedback as, uh, as we cycle through that one in the first year, especially in the second year. And so just to clarify on that, so this up, upcoming school year, there's still only a two-day we're approving for the year after that. So if people are watching or listening, don't plan a full week for fall break this year. That is correct. This year is still the, the normal fall break that we've operated under. It is not a week-long fall break. This year, this starts in 23-24 and then 24-25. Appreciate that clarification. Yes. We we're already getting lots of questions about that because I think a lot of people have a lot more funner future plans than I do. <laughs> so definitely exciting. Thank you. And then I do know, too, um, we partner with the Carmel Parks Department for ESD. I know in the past when we've had holidays and stuff, they've offered different things. And we also partner with the Carmel Youth Assistance Foundation. So I think that's something that we can work with, with your point about food insecurity. So thank you. All right, we'll now take a vote. All those in favor of approving the 2023, 2024, 2024, 2025, tongue tuck twister, <laughs> Carmel Clay School calendar, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. All right. Our next item is the material rental fee changes for 2022, 2023. Um, Dr. Dudley. Yes, thank you. So this evening, I bring to you for recommendation our material rental fee changes for um, this next school year. And um, some of the changes are due to new adoptions of materials. Some are due to um, the continued use of certain materials. And some are um, due to some curriculum changes of the fee materials as well. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to approve? Thank you, Ms. Jackson. A second? Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Any discussion? Um, I do have one. Um, I do appreciate, I see that there's quite a few that are going down, and some are going up, but no more. I think the maximum I see is $9. 
um, that's going up. Um, to clarify for those two, we do have the materials fees, but we also for the elementary and middle school have supply fees also. And then high school, there is not a supply fee. That is correct. Thank you. And then for those who are on free or reduced lunch, we also have um, options for them too. So our students that um, receive free and reduced lunch, they do not um, need to pay their fees and then they are covered by the, uh, in part by the state. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? All right, do I, we will now take a vote. Do I have a motion to approve the 2022-2023 material rental and fee changes? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thanks. <laughs> All right, we'll now move on to the discussion portion of our meeting, the Hamilton County Center for Career Achievement. We have um, Dr. Um, Beresford and Dr. Dudley. Yeah, I'll, I'll introduce Dr. Dudley. Um, but... Uh, uh, some exciting things going on in Hamilton County, and one of those is um, uh, to develop the development of a Hamilton County um, career uh, program. And so the six school districts in Hamilton County are, are working together uh, to create something a little new, something a little innovative in the world of our uh, career technical education. And so uh, I have shared with you some information about that and a potential agreement that you can review. And I've asked uh, Dr. Dudley to come and, and just kind of walk through some of the information and uh, about this, this new innovative programming. So Dr. Dudley, take it away. Thank you. And so um, as Dr. Beresford said, we're very excited to share um, this information about the Hamilton County Center for Career and Achievement. And this is um, a collaborative partnership between the schools in Hamilton County to help um, better meet the needs of our students that are interested in pursuing career and technical education coursework at Carmel High School um, and also across the county. Um, Carrie Lively is the director of the Hamilton County Center for Career Achievement, and she wanted to be here this evening, but unfortunately she is out of town, so she was not able to be here this evening. So to get started, um, let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, since 1972, we have been partnering, partnering with J. Everett Light Career Center in Washington Township. And they um, have helped us, supported us in our career and technical education um, coursework that our students take. Um, we've done several different workshops over the last couple of years where, we, where we've shared our um, PTE pathways. And many of those pathways we actually offer at Carmel High School. And then we do have a small number of our students that do attend J. Everett Light Career and Technical Education for pathways that we do not um, offer. And the, one of the things, um, this is in Washington Township, um, and there, there's just some, there, there are some things that um, maybe don't fit as well as we would like. And for the, about the last 30 years, I think, in Hamilton County, they've been talking about how can we best meet the needs of our students and provide them with all of those um, pathways. So the last several years, the idea of having um, a career center in Hamilton County came about. And in 2021, the Hamilton County Council um, allocated $425,000 to create the Hamilton County Center for Career and Achievement. But the um, thought of this is not to have another brick and mortar building, not to have where our students go to a career center to have courses, but to really look at partnerships, to look at um, share resources across the county, and look at maybe some different ways to provide those pathways for our students that we'll talk about in here in just a second. So the Hamilton County Career Center is um, designed to expand those career pathways um, for our students, to build partnerships with businesses in Hamilton County um, for our students to get that hands-on learning, and also the alignment of those educational opportunities to meet the demands of local industry within Hamilton County. And to build those partnerships too, so many of our students um, may study different career pathways, then they go off to some a secondary experience, and they may come back, we want them to come back to Hamilton County and work back here, and they already may have some of those partnerships if we um, develop those while they're still in high school as well, they have those um, connections that they can come back to. So this is not just you know about the education and the courses, but we're truly trying to align that education and the workforce and economic development in all of Hamilton County and work together in that partnership. And so we're excited about um, this new um, potential partnership with them. 
So just to give you some more details, um, as we shared, we have many of our students that do take career and technical education courses. Um, so over this past year, school year, we had 4,344 career and technical courses taken. So that a student may take several different courses. That's not 4,344 students, but those students are, may take multiple courses. Um, and out of those courses taken, 4,293 of those courses were taken at Carmel High School because we do offer the majority of those pathways um, and we're very fortunate that we have a comprehensive high school and we have the means that we can offer them in um, on site. And we did have 51 students that attended, and these were juniors and seniors, that attended courses at um, J. Everett Light. Um, a couple of the things that are some barrier to the students attending at J. Everett Light are that the, as I said, the schedule is different. Our, our school calendar is different than Washington Township school calendar. So the students, they may have siblings that are on different calendars because they follow the calendar um, at J. Everett Light. But so that, that's one barrier. Another one, too, is it really blocks the student's um, schedule up because they take, they're either in Carmel High School in the morning or they're at Carmel High School in the afternoon, and so they can only do a half day of getting in the other um, diploma requirements, and then they need travel time to get to J. Everett Light. And so it doesn't provide as much flexibility for our students that um, take the courses at J. Everett Light. So those are just a few barriers. Um, the way this is funded, we get funded in uh, two different ways for our career and technical education. We get state funding, which um, for the courses that we offer, there's um, different levels. The state funds different courses, and so we get state funding um, per course. And then there's also um, federal funding called Perkins funding. So when our students go to JEL, we pay transfer tuition for our students. So in our students, um, this past year, we paid $178,500 for our students to t attend the courses at JEL. So that's about $3,500 per student. And then we also generate um, Perkins funding of $132,987. Right now, that money is stays at JEL to help um, fund the, the building, to fund the staffing, to fund all of the courses that they offer there. So we, we don't see the funding of that Perkins money um, right now at, with our partnership with JEL. And then we generated um, 1.8 million, a little bit over 1.8 million um, for the courses that we've taught at Carmel High School. And so that money goes into um, paying for our staff that teaches those courses, paying for equipment for the um, courses, and then also paying for supplies in those specific courses. The majority of that money does go into paying for the staff that um, teaches those CTE courses. So one of the things that you know will be a benefit, um, it, it, because it is costly to send our students to JEL, and I talked about the other barriers. And so you know, here here's a breakdown of the courses taken, the money generated, and we're um, when you just divide it evenly per course, and the money generated does not come out evenly. There's high um, dollar courses, and then that we get um, less money for um, lower in demand courses. But if you just broke it out evenly, we're looking at about um, supporting the courses at the high school at four hundred fifteen dollars and sixteen cents for every course that is taken. However, with our fifty one students attending JEL, that cost is a lot more per student because I said we pay the tuition, the transfer tuition, and then also the Perkins money that is generated from our students stays at JEL. So that's about $311,000 for it. And so it's between the 51 students, that's about $6,107 per student. So as we think about, you know, one of the reasons of changing is could, that, could we um, take those funds and um, bring them back into the county and really look at how do we best suit the needs of our students and provide um, additional pathways for those students. And so over an eight-year period, um, this is looking at if we kept that about our 2% of our students attending um, and the money that we would generate for our 11th and 12th graders through that Perkins funds as well as uh, money we would send, it would be about $2.7 over that eight-year period that we could look at 
funding within our district and also partnerships with our other um, schools within Hamilton County and really looking at some very different um, ways of educating the students. For example, some of our students that go to JEL, um, they go for welding. That is not a career pathway that we offer at Carmel High School and to have the welding rooms and all of those pieces, that's not one that we're, we're set up to do that. And with Roger and the construction that he's working on now, that's not in our plan as of right now <laughs> uh, to do that piece. But so we, and we do, that is a high demand course. So how might we offer that without our students going to JEL? Well, one of the um, things in is Students could still go to JEL if there's room for our students to go there and we would just pay per student that transfer tuition. Um, but uh, one thing that's really exciting is that they're piloting within the county that our students are going into the manufacturing, into companies, and they're learning those welding skills within the company with hands-on in building that partnership. And that's a piece that Noblesville School is now piloting that and it's going very well those piece and um, the same thing with the cosmetology that is another career pathway we do not offer at Carmel High School and we do have a, a small number of students that participate in that career pathway um, one of the pieces that they're piloting is that the students would go and um, learn the cosmetology and but they would be in real world in a salon learning those pathways so we're really looking at are there different ways that we can think about um, having those hands-on um, learning experiences for our students so the role of the Hamilton County um, Center for Achievement is there, there's six different major um, areas that they would be working on. One is looking at our CTE appeals. And what this means is when the state comes through and um, they talk about, you know, what are the high demand courses, um, looking at the workforce development, and they fund courses at different levels. Um, one of the things that if, you know, we can prove that it is a, a higher demand here in Hamilton County, and this is something for our economy that we need, we can do an appeal to try to get some of those courses funded at, at a higher level um, through the state. And so that would be one role that um, the HCCCA would um, help us with to developing those appeals. Another piece is the 30A management. What that is, is that is this um, major um, reporting tool that we need to do each year to um, get that reimbursement from um, for the state CTE funding. Um, and it is, it's a very in-depth piece. Um, there's a lot of technical aspects to it. Right now, we do that through J. Everett Light. Um, the Hamilton County um, Career Center, they would take over helping to support us with that, with the technical piece of that, to make sure that we um, do get our maximum funding that is, should be allotted to us. Um, another area is that community relations. And so building those partnerships with different businesses within the community and, um, and helping us form those partnerships. Um, the executive director, she has already, you know, we've been working with her in different areas where she's reached out to us on, um, here's a, a partnership that we might want to think about for future um, CTE pathways. And this might be a, a great way to work with um, different industries within Hamilton County. And they'll, they'll work on um, helping to form those partnerships where we can um, benefit from those. Also, looking at our Perkins guidance right now, as I said, those Perkins funds stay with JEL. Um, one of the um, positive things with the Hamilton County Career Center is that the, we, we're not supporting a building. We're not supporting all of these programs. So the overhead costs are much less. The overhead costs of just supporting the administrative um, work with the executive director and any um, administrative assistance work that they might need. So it, the cost is much less. And so we would realize some of those Perkins funding that would come back to our district that we can use right within um, the school to continue to expand those pathways. Um, another piece that they would help us with is that licensing and management. We do need to be connected with a career center when we look at our different licensing as far as like our work-based licenses. For example, our um, CNA courses and our EMT courses, the um, people that teach those courses, they do not have a teaching degree because they're you know, an EMT or a certified nursing assistant, but they have what's called a work-based license. 
And so um, the Career Center, what they do is they look at their credentials, they make sure that they have everything that they need to um, give them that workplace licensing to make sure that we're in compliance and we're getting the very best people to um, teach our students. And then also um, another piece, and we've already realized this, um, some of the benefits of this one, is that fundraising and grants. And they're very much looking at how can they um, build those partnerships with the community and how can they get um, some of that fundraising um, to provide for the overhead costs, but then also for us to expand. Um, just recently, we worked with them on uh, the 3E grant, which was a DOE grant from the state. Um, we were asking for 3.5 million. The state had an overwhelming number of proposals, and this was a competitive grant, but the 3E grant was um, funded at just over 2.5 Five million, and Carmel has benefited. We um, have funding for three hundred thirty-eight thousand um, dollars of that grant over a two-year period. And what we're going to use that grant for, we're really excited about this piece, is to fund um, additional, you know, equipment for pathways so that we can expand um, two of our pathways that we currently offer and uh, get fund some equipment. One of them is in the area of automotive, where we need some really large equipment to hold to. I believe it's to hold the cars up. Um, so it's just large equipment, but to fund that. But then also, it, um, what's really exciting is to fund a work-based um, learning capstone coordinator. So if you'll recall, uh, several months ago, we came and we talked about the different CTE pathways, and many of those pathways end in a culminating capstone. So their senior year, where they're having that hands-on learning, where they're going into the community, um, doing different internships, um, this will help to fund a person that can coordinate this, that can help going out, building those partnerships with the community, connecting our students, uh, being that liaison so our students can really um, realize, you know, have that hands-on learning right in, in the real world as they're still in, you know, um, high school. So we're very excited about that, and we've already realized um, the possibilities there in a very small amount. So as I said, this is a um, collaborative effort between the diff six different schools in Hamilton County. Um, this year, the Hamilton County um, Career Center is fully funded, so it's already fully funded. Um, next year, you can see their operating budget is about 476000 That would fund the um, overhead costs of the executive director and an administrative fee. So as Dr. Beresford said, he would come back to you um, in the future with a, um, an agreement for you to consider for us to um, partner in this new endeavor. So I have questions, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dudley. Questions from the board? Okay, Ms. Jackson? Yeah, I'm excited that we're leaning in here and looking at um, ways to continue to equip our students for a good or a great transition into the real world, working world. <laughs> um, I have lots of questions, but um, so I think what I've heard as far as bottom line dollars on the Perkins side, that 132, I want to be clear, would that be funded back into our student or just the county itself? So it, it would come back to the Career Center, but then those funds, as we've worked with the um, executive director, would then come back to Carmel High School. Okay. And so with the grant that we just received, the plan for the grant, as I talked about, we were talking about um, funding the work-based learning um, capstone coordinator. Mm -hmm. That's a two-year grant, so we, we have the funds now to do that for a two-year grant, but whenever we write a grant, we have to look at how can we sustain this, especially when we're looking at personnel. Mm -hmm. And so our plan would be to use those Perkins funds generated to come back to continue to sustain that um, position. Yeah, I'm excited about that role too, the coordinator role. Um, and then could you, when you said transfer tuition, you said students, if they still wanted to go to J, JL, we could fund transferring tuition. I'm sorry, I didn't fully catch that. Can you help me understand? Yeah, so right now, um, when our students go to JEL, we pay, um, not, we pay tuition to Washington Township for our students to take the courses at JEL. Mm -hmm. And so right now, that um, transfer tuition 
for our 51 students, we paid $178,000 this past year. Mm -hmm. So that, that's for our students to go to JEL, and then that pays for their overhead costs, which would be the teachers, mm -hmm. the building, all of those, the supplies, those things that they're doing at JEL. Okay, yes. I thought you were saying that if we transition to another, like, um, in-county uh, opportunity, we would still fund tuition, uh, tuition if they still wanted to go to JEL. So as we transition to this, the um, for the Career Center to get up and running in Hamilton County, it's a it's over a, a year process. Okay. So the first thing they have to do is they have to do a, a needs analysis that they're working on, then they have to get approved by the state. Mm -hmm. So as we transition, we may have some students that start at JEL in their junior year and mm -hmm. they'll want to finish their um, experience at JEL. Mm -hmm. So then we would allow them to go back to JEL and um, have that same experience. So if they started in their junior year, we want them to finish up their senior year. Mm -hmm. And then there might be a student in the future as well that as we look at, you know, this is a career pathway this student is very interested in, and we don't have an option somewhere in Hamilton County that is an option for that student, then we'll, we can look at JEL, and if they have seats available, we could allow them to go back there. So we... I mean, the whole purpose of this is to get our students um, to have the opportunity to have those pathways that they're very interested in and learn more about. Okay, thank this you. This will That's allow helpful. that for us to go. Okay. Can I, I've got questions. I just want to interrupt here. Mm -hmm. So with the transfer tuition, if they're going half a day or a quarter of a day, are we only paying pro rata? Yes. Okay. Yes. They go a half a day right now, and we're paying for a half day for them to be educated there. Okay. Um, I have a couple more questions. You want to go ahead? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, being in a field that relies heavily on this type of an internship experience, I realize that it's solely, uh, the, the, its success is based on the proctor who is overseeing these students. And so it's extremely concerning to me that we're going to be bringing children into these types of situations where they may, I mean, at, at J. Everett Light, which I was a product of that, they are being taught by people who are teachers along with having the skills. And then this is going into a community, sending them into, just because you brought up that, um, I mean, if, maybe a funeral home or a cosmetology salon or a welding situation where these people are not necessarily skilled at teaching. And so how are the metrics going to be established so that we know that this isn't just going to be time wasted? Because I've seen that in the funeral industry where you send somebody into a two-year or one-year long internship, and depending on how skilled the person is who's overseeing them, they may be just be spending time dusting, not really getting the skills necessary so that they can, su can succeed in that s field. Yes, I know, that's a good, great question. And so one of the things is it's not um, like if we think about like a college internship where they, they're going out in the field. When they're looking like for the cosmetology piece, it wouldn't be that they just go into the salon and they're at the whim of the salon owner and they're mm -hmm. cleaning up. There, there also is a teacher component of that, so there's still a work-based learning component of that, so they mm -hmm. still have, um, th they're working on, you know, their, their book knowledge and I can't. Curriculum, so they have their, like a their curriculum. Their curriculum, yeah, okay. they're working on those pieces, and, but then they also, they can apply it right away. So, but that would take, instead of that taking place at JEL, that would take place at the salon and it could be a combination at the salon, it could be a combination at Carmel High School, or it could be a combination at the salon and maybe Westfield High School, um, depending on where, you know, where the, the salon might be located or what have you. But the partners so, will be highly vetted in terms yes. of what the metrics will be that we expect in each of those situations? Yeah. There, yeah. there are several different pieces that we need to uh, make sure that we have. It's not only the um, instructors that are working with our students, but then also the safety of our students and making sure that not only the um, instructors working with them, but when we send them out into an internship, we need to make sure we're vetting that business and any anybody that our students are coming into contact with. And I know Dr. Bear Stewart has worked like in another district with this, and so he may want to speak more. 
Yeah, uh, first step was that when you saw the slide, it said licensing. Uh, now that isn't like um, we check and see if you've worked at a you know at a job and okay you worked at a job so now you're licensed. It's a process. Mm -hmm. So they they don't they don't get a license just because they've worked in a field. They they have to have a skill set to be able. Uh, I would liken it to like the apprenticeship program. Um, you know, there's a component of comp of a apprenticeship where you have to learn the trade and then you work. You know, after you've learned the fundamentals, and then you work to, to, you know, hone your craft. But you do that under the supervision of someone who knows what they're doing and and can grow you that way. So that licensing component is really really important. The other key position that Amy I think highlighted really well is uh, this person that's going to be the capstone person. And what that position is is that's the person that will be tapping into the county resources, and whether that's at Ivy Tech or whether that's at one of the other school districts or whether that's with, with businesses that are within Carmel, uh, where our kids have interest in the, that field of work. Um, and that person is going to be a key position because they're going to not only have to vet what the experience would be like, but also what will be the environment that the student will be in in that mm -hmm. setting. So uh, it isn't as simply as like, remember the old shadow days where you get to go out and shadow a job or something like that? And uh, you just kind of hang around and watch and see what happens. But this is actually part of a, a, of a sequence of instruction that goes on. And so uh, the exciting part about it is, is a lot of times, um, you know, we do a lot of things in a building and the kid gets a lot of background knowledge and stuff, but they never really do it. Uh, and like in this situation, it is a situation where they'll get that instruction, then they'll actually get to uh, practice it. And uh, with that kind of the picture that you'd be preparing that junior year, sometimes even younger than that, and then the senior year you'd be prepared to go into, you know, what I would say, what would be the old days they called it an apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and that's kind of what the what the, the the purpose of it is. So it's not going to be just to go hang out and see how you do. It's gonna it's a, it's gonna be a sequence of, of of experience, and that's what's kind of innovative about it because they won't go into a building. Uh, which is the typical vocational setting, and just go there and do the coursework or whatever you know the experience is there, and then then go out and you know see kind of the like real world experiences. But hopefully we'll be able to get to a point where the, you know they'll be set up to be able to try some things that have some real experience, possibly get certifications before they uh, graduate from high school. Uh, right now we've got two two of, uh, where uh, certified nursing assistants they can be certified before they graduate from high school our EMT program that can be certified before they get out of high school. And so they have taken the exact same preparation that anybody out of, out of high school would take that same preparation to be able to, to get those credentials. Um, the idea of it's kind of interesting just because we have different, you know, like, like they have a really good ag program at Hamilton Heights. We don't have an ag program. So if somebody's interested in ag science, that may be something we could tap into with them so they could get that background knowledge and that. Um, and then it may be a you know a, you know some play, Westfield doesn't have a program that we have. Um, um, we're fortunate that we do have a very robust career technical education at Carmel High School. There's um, there's just a lot going on there. If you got to see the tiny house the kids built and building trades, um, there's just a lot of great opportunities there. But um, with this setting, I think we can go even to the next step, and uh, I'm kind of excited about that. But I don't want you to think that we're just going to send kids out and and, and hope hope for the best because. That, that training by that qualified licensed person is going to be key before they ever get to the point where they get to go out and, uh, and, and do real world experience. Have that we thought sense. about like piloting? You know, I, I think we're, you know, we're in the early stages of figuring out what this looks like, but it might be um, great to pilot certain pieces and get feedback from the students. Because I was interested in hearing, you know, do have we gotten any feedback from the students to give us, um, I don't know, a, a lens on how things are going in being at JEL and if they feel, felt prepared going into their field. Have we gotten any data on that? So um, we do get feedback from our students on, in all of the pieces in their senior survey, but then also for the JEL and looking at, um, we look at not only how prepared do they feel and then also looking at the students that are move, going to JEL and then not going to a secondary experience, but mm -hmm. going right into the workforce, how many of them get jobs, and we, we have data on those pieces. And then we can we analyze that data as well to see what it is. But we're always looking at what what are our students 
not only what, you know, what is the um, workforce development, what, what are they calling for, what are the industries that are in most need, but then also what are the interests of our students. And that's how we brought in just um, a couple years ago the EMT and the CNA. That was a big interest for our students, and so that's why we added that career pathway. Mm -hmm. That was a pathway that our students um, were able to do at JEL, but we felt like we could um, have them do that at Carmel High School because we had enough interest mm -hmm. in it. And then it also helped our students where they didn't have the barriers of the two different schedules or mm -hmm. having to travel to JEL. And, be, and because we had enough students that had an interest in that program, we were able to bring that pathway. Yeah. The last question I just have is, um, you know, JEL, our partnership with them, provides our students another opportunity to be in a different environment, an environment that is a bit mm -hmm. different than our Hamilton County environment. And so, you know, transitioning them away from some of the city interactions, when I think city, big city, Indy, to a smaller cities, you know, Carmel, which I love, but uh, in Westfield and Noblesville, that is, you know, I feel like that would be a little bit of a gap there. So, you know, if there would just be a consideration around that, I, I just would. That that's would that's probably a good segue to talk a little bit about the agreement. Um, and uh, the agreement was designed similar to, I don't know if you guys um, have a background, we used to be in a, a co-op for special education where all the city, all the schools in the county and surrounding areas uh, all pitched in together to, to do different uh, programs in different school districts. So school, students with different disabilities would go to maybe even a different school district uh, because they have this, the program. And so the agreement is similar to that where the, all six of the Hamilton County school districts are, are going to come together for an agreement. And in, in those agreements, you have to pick one school to be kind of like the lead um, custodian of the program. And in this case, it's going to be Westfield. And so they'll be the, it was a, the LEA, I believe is the, the correct um, acronym for them. And then uh, kind of what Amy described is you can't just like stop going in a, in a program because kids are in that program right now and they're progressing in that program. We don't want to ever pull a kid out of a program when they're progressing. So the agreement allows for students to transition uh, or complete whatever they've started if they want to, or they could transition to a, uh, you know the different program that we might have for them. Uh, so there's kind of a piece of it that goes on. So the idea is over the next year is to transition to the Hamilton County Career uh, Center, but also uh, to have an open door, like if a student next year starts the program, they can go the next year and still complete their program if, if it's something that they're interested in and that J. Everett Light provides. So th there's still an opportunity there. And as Amy explained before, there may be a programming at J. Everett Light that the Hamilton County group doesn't really have and a student's interested in that. We always try to, to find a way to show the children to get what they want and uh, pursue what they're interested in. Uh, when we were working on our tagline, remember our Find Your Future tagline? Uh, this is really right in that, that wheelhouse where it's uh, finding your future. But you'll see in that agreement, uh, you know, all different pieces. And if you have any questions about that, I'd be glad to do it. Um, our our counsel, David Day, uh, was the one who uh, created that. And if you have any questions, we can get those answered. Mr. Kirshner? Uh, I, I feel like I have a lot of questions. I know we're early in the process, and I appreciate, you know, that we're early in the process. I guess my first question is, whose whose slideshow is this? Is this HCC A slideshow? Okay. Um, so back to the I guess funding page. Um, right. Um, that one. So I guess the question I asked before is: so we get prorated for transfer tuition to JEL. So I'm assuming that this 1.8 million is just for those courses. So if a student's taking one course and four other courses, then it's really costing us more for that. I mean, to me, these numbers are a little, and maybe not this one, a little misleading because we don't have a, you know, a, a, a cost per. We get so much for the state, and we're giving you know so much to the other thing. And what does it cost us? So I know that's probably more detail than we're prepared to talk about today. But I, I just either I'm not understanding something, or those numbers make it look better than it really can be. I think. Let me let me try to clarify. Okay. So the 1.8 million 
that is funding that um, for all of the courses that we offer at um, all of the courses that our students take, all of the CTE courses, they get funded at different levels. For example, the CNA course gets funded $680 per course that the students take. And the CNA courses, they take three different courses. So it's $680 times three per student that complete the CNA program. So we get $680 from state CTE money for that student. Cosmetology courses, they get funded at $200 per course. So if our students are taking cosmetology at JEL, um, for the courses that they take there, we get funded from the state $200. So that funding comes to us, and then we use part of that funding to pay for the transfer tuition of our students that go to JEL, which is the $178,500. And then there's, so that's the bulk of the money that we get funded for is the state um, CTE money. Then there is a much smaller grant, the Perkins grant, where our, the number of our students that are taking um, CTE courses through federal money, that's the federal money, the Perkins Grant, the Career Center, right now JEL gets funded based on uh, the number, total number of our students taking CTE courses, and that Perkins Fund, right now, they stay at JEL. So even though our students are generating those federal dollars, that money stays there. Does that, I don't know. Yeah, but so those CTE dollars are above and beyond what we get per student from the state. Yes. Because yes. It, the, the state is incentivizing us to put those students in those programs. Yes. Okay, and so that wasn't, I don't think, clear Sorry. on the slide. Yeah, I, I would tell you, just a blanket, I would just say this isn't about a financial advantage. Uh, this is more about opportunities for our students, uh, you know, to, to get a career in technical education. Uh, we're not looking to save a, a lot of money. Um, and, uh, we, you know, the cost for 51 students, it's, it's, it looks like a big number, but that's not, that's not huge money for a, a, a vocational program. Um, so it's, this really isn't about money. But uh, you make a great point. That funding for CTE is beyond the amount of funding we get from the state per student. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at my peripheral vision to make sure that Mr. McMichael is nodding his head yes, which he is. Uh, the other uh, piece to that is uh, Amy was trying to simplify, but the, the state, you saw on that slide where it says negotiate or appeal, appeal the uh, funding, is not only does the state give so much money per, you know, workforce field, um, they decide whether some are worth more money because there's more need in that field and others that they feel like aren't a big need in the field that they'll, they, they lower the cost for that. And then they have a system so you can say, well, wait a minute, in Hamilton County, we have that need, and so it should be hunted, uh, funded higher. And so, uh, and that's a, that's a, a, you know, that art of fiduciary uh, responsibility, and, and that's part of the, the role of the HCCA. So that's kind of the, but I don't want you to get confused. We're, we're not making this uh, recommendation based on any kind of cost savings or gain or loss there. It's more about what's the best we can do with our funding for our students. Well, and I appreciate that answer because that slide sure made it look like it was all about the dollars and that the reason we're doing this is we're shipping all our money to, and we're going to keep it in. And yeah. I guess I also think it's important to know, and you kind of hit upon this before, um, out of the six districts, there's uh, and I may, I may be doing this incorrectly, but there's probably maybe three big and two medium and one small and whatever that is. So um, we don't, I don't know the details about what the other districts do and if they go to, to JEL. Um, you know, what, what did excite me that you said, Dr. Beresford, was the ag program. Um, and we've been talking about that for a while here and that we don't have one here and the fact that Hamilton County has um, a worldwide seed production company that if we could tap into that for students that are interested, you know, that would be great. And other ag things, just because you live in Carmel doesn't mean you don't want a career in ag, so we've got lots of things about that. So, so that is exciting to me. Um, and so I think you said part of the process will be is we'll look at who offers what and figure out what's the best way for people to go that. So we may have a lot of kids coming to 
programs here because we already have those and I'm assuming it'd be the same tuition funding mechanism that would you know if we send there they send here that we I guess more bookkeeping for Roger um, but well, hopefully the idea is that uh, the leadership you know the HCCA will be doing the fiduciary work of that so that shouldn't be on putting putting too much on Roger uh, and th that's the that's why that agreement is so important and uh, I think it will be uh, has a potential to be very more efficient um, but I do see it as a situation where like if we've got some open seats in programming that we have um, you know there, there's a logistic side of this too because I could see like Westfield you know pretty close proximity might be easier to share than us going you know all the way to Noblesville or something like that so um, it just it will it'll be interesting and creative and innovative on how how that'll play out. But uh, but that's the uh, I think there will be some opportunities for our kids to get things that they can't get right now uh, through this. So and then that, that opportunity, like I think you've already said this. So if it turned out that there'd be a better fit in the future for a kid to go to JEL either because he lives closer or for some other factor. Um, we would look on it, uh, I'm going to look over here, students are the center of every decision. So we would look at that child and what makes sense for that child to make sure that we're doing the best we can for them. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's one of the nice things about where we're located and, you know, tapping into the resources that we have. And one thing I'm really excited about, the opportunity, of, and, I, and I know Amy and I have had this conversation, is that uh, we've got a lot of resources in this area where kids could really get some pretty, uh, like we had one kid working on cybersecurity with a, he had like a, an apprentice, not apprenticeship, what we call an internship, with, uh, and that kid was knocking it out of the park. They wanted to hire him, you know, on the spot. Um, so I, we've got a lot of really good resources to tap into in, in our area, and this might be a great way to organize that and, and, uh, be able to, to vet it better, I think. Okay, and then I, I think my last question, we, we talked about Washington Township having a different schedule. I'm assuming that all six, I know all six, six districts aren't the exact same, but they're probably closer to what our schedule is. And Their, their um, calendars are different, yeah. I mean, some of them are closer than others. Okay. Yeah, it, I mean, it, just like we just changed our calendar, it... It may change over the years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I have questions now. Sorry. I waited my turn. Um, okay, so for collaboration with other schools, refresh my memory. We have Noblesville, Carmel, HSD, Hamilton Heights. Who am I missing? Sheridan and Westfield. Okay, thank you. No offense to either of them. Um, the um, we talked about one of the things that Carmel is so proud of is our corporate headquarters. So I think one of the things that I love about this is that partnership. We're building Republic Airways headquarters. Goodness knows we need pilots. So I think that some of those different opportunities that we can pre present to our students I think is just amazing. And I love that there would be someone who's looking at those different types of things. So I, that's more of a comment. The 476, a um, couple slides further, um, so that is something that would be then split up between all of these schools. Is that correct? Yes. To be determined how and yes. why? Okay. All right. And then this was a discussion item. So, um, Dr. Beresford, can you explain a little bit about what you will be coming to the board and asking? Uh, I'll be returning to you with the with the agreement. And uh, the, we ask that the board would approve that agreement and sign off on it. And then that would officially put us into the into the the, the cooperative agreement with the other five districts uh, to go ahead and start pursuing this. Thank you so much. Any other questions, final comments? All right. We will now move on to reports. Um, student data report, Dr. Dudley. All right, well, thank you. Um, and so I have um, two very exciting um, bits of information for you. The first one has nothing to do with this slide. <laughs> uh, the first one is after, you know, um, feedback from our parents, from our teachers, from our principals, we are bringing back parent-teacher conferences at the elementary schools. So we're very excited about that. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, so at the elementary level. So if you've been in our district for a long time, you may recall in the past we used to do our parent-teacher conferences right around fall break. Um, this year what we're looking at is to move it away from fall break since next year fall break will be much longer. Um, so we're looking at November 3rd. Our and the way we can do these um, parent-teacher conferences without changing the calendar and adding extra days for our elementary students is using our performance qualified status that we have. Um, and so our students will come on November 3rd. They'll come in the morning. They'll come for a half day of school. The buses will pick them up when we dismiss and they'll take them home. And then parent-teacher conferences will start um, around noon after teachers have had an opportunity to have lunch. And they'll go until the evening. They'll go until 7.30 in the evening. And then um, the next day, students will not come to school at all. That's a Friday, November 4th. Students will um, not come to school. Um, teachers will hold parent-teacher conferences in the morning, and then the teachers will have the opportunity to um, go home Friday afternoon since they worked late into the evening the night before. Um, and that was uh, that's very similar to how we did parent-teacher conferences years ago before we had to eliminate them from our conference. So we're really excited about um, bringing those back, and I know our um, teachers are excited, our principals are excited, and I know our um, parents will be very excited as well because that's one thing we continue to hear we need to have more of that ongoing um, feedback and that um, attention to that. So we're excited about that piece. So that's the, the first part of my report. And then the second part does have to do with our slide here, our uh, congratulations to our graduates. So I just wanted to share um, some information on the different types of um, diplomas that we had here in um, Carmel Clay Schools for our graduating class of 2022. But before I do that, I just want to refresh your memory. Um, last November, we had a board um, workshop that uh, Mrs. Teal from the high school came, and she shared with us um, information about graduation pathways. Um, the 2023 class, so this new class that's coming in that will come on August 10th, um, they are required to um, graduate going through the graduation pathways. The class of 2022 and 2021, they had the option to graduate using a pathway, but it was not required. It will be required for all of our in, for all of our students that will graduate this year, all of our seniors um, for this year. So just to refresh your um, memory for the graduation pathways, there are three what we call buckets that students have to um, accomplish in order to graduate. The first one is to earn an Indiana high school diploma. And the, the next part of my report is going to talk about the, the types of diplomas our 2022 graduates earn. But there's three different types of diplomas that students can earn. That is the core 40 diploma. That would be a standard diploma where they um, amass enough credits in um, different areas of English, science, social studies, uh, uh, math, elective areas, um, and they to earn that diploma. And then there's two advanced, or what we would call an honors diploma. One is a core 40 with academic honors. So they actually um, earn more than um, 40 credits. They have to earn up to 46 credits. They have to earn so many um, credits in a world language. They have to um, have take advanced classes. They um, have to earn um, you know, credits in those advanced classes and take the um, the AP course or the AP test for those advanced classes or the IB test for those classes. And then there's also the core 40 with technical honors, which they're taking advanced classes more in our CTE area. So they're at that higher level, those advanced classes. So those are the three types of diplomas our students have. So that's the first bucket students have to complete. The second one is, um, and this ties into expanding our um, opportunities, is they need to learn and demonstrate employability skills in at least one area. And there's a variety of ways to do that. That can be through um, participating in project-based learning projects, um, doing service-based learning, and then also work-based learning. So that work-based learning could be those um, internships or those um, apprenticeships that they're, um, our students are working on. And then also the third bucket that our students have to um, demonstrate is demonstrate one post-secondary readiness competency. And that can be in a, a variety of ways. So the first one could be honing, um, earning an honors diploma. So if they, are, they earned the academic honors or the technical honors, they completed both of those buckets. 
or um, getting a benchmark score on a standardized assessment. And when I say standardized assessment, um, our students, our juniors now take um, SAT as an accountability measure, but if they um, get the benchmark score on the SAT, that would um, demonstrate that post-secondary readiness. Um, or they can also take the ASVAB, which is the military assessment, and if they get a, um, a benchmark score on that, that can also um, fulfill this requirement. Also taking advanced coursework, so taking AP classes, taking IB classes, taking the um, dual credit um, classes that we offer at the high school, and we have lots of opportunities for our students. That's another area that would fulfill this. And then also um, participating in our CTE Catholic that we talked about, and um, also getting those industry certifications. So our students that are participating in our CNA and getting the certification as a CNA, um, we also have industry certifications in culinary arts. We have industry certifications in business that our students can um, have the opportunity to do. So lots of opportunities, but that's for all of our students coming um, into their senior year. They are going to be well-versed, but these will be the new requirements for them. So um, prior to this, our students had to earn a diploma, and so our graduating class of 2022, um, the types of diplomas that we offered, let me go back to this one, is I, I just wanted to show you um, just our, our graduating class, our students, as we talk about, it, are always amazing. But almost 60% of our students earned that advanced or that honors diploma. Um, or the graduating class of 2022. And as we look at our data over the course of three years, this number is consistent, that more than half of our students are earning that academic honors diploma um, in a variety of ways. And so the way that is broken down is we have 56.15% um, of our students, so that's the majority of our students, are earning that um, 440 academic honors diploma. Um, just a little bit over half, so 0.6. 63% are earning the Core 40 Technical Honors Diploma, and then 3.15% of our students are earning both the Core 40 Academic and Technical Honors Diploma. So that, that makes up our almost 60% of our students earning those, um, those Honors Diplomas. And then we have 38.41% um, of our students are earning the Core 40 Diploma, and then 1.66% of our students are earning a General Diploma. I wanted to just share that information with you and just how proud we are of all of our students and our um, graduating seniors that we just um, said goodbye to. And we're welcoming in our new class of 2023 with their graduation packet. Are there any questions you might have? Thank you so much, Dr. Dudley. Questions from the board? Yeah, Please. I'm super excited. Um, about this year, you know, my daughter will be a senior, so <laughs> I have vested interest there too. Um, do we have any data on how folks that maybe were newer to our district are performing in this kind of um, breakdown? Like their assimilation, or how are they able to kind of pick up the pieces coming into, I don't know, we've got a really rigorous program. Do we know how they're doing or how the stats are going out with that? So we can, we can mine that data. Okay. We, I have not, but we, we certainly can mine that. But you're right, as students that come in, um, you know, how, how are we wrapping around and supporting mm -hmm. them so that they can, you know, especially it's very difficult when you come in maybe your junior or yeah. senior year. Yeah. Um, and, and how do they um, get that? And one of the pieces, too, for to be counted in the graduation um, numbers, it's, it's only counting graduates that graduate within four years. They call it the graduation cohort. Okay. Even though we have some students that do take five years to graduate, they took longer to graduate, they're not counted in that graduation number because it's only looking at the four-year cohort. Okay. Um, but they still graduate, but sometimes it takes students longer to yeah. do that. Um, but we can certainly mine that data. Okay. Any other questions from the board? I just have a comment. So you're going to have a senior and I'm going to have a freshman. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely exciting. The Carmel High School course catalog rivals a junior college anywhere. It's amazing opportunities that we give to our students. Um, I love hearing about the technical stuff. We um, hear a lot about the college things and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we have so many opportunities for kids with the technical things, and they're doing so many amazing things. So I think that was a really great lead-in to this um, thing. So we're so proud of our Greyhounds and the, the 
the t class of 2026 that's going to be starting here in a few weeks, mm -hmm. and then the class of 2023. It's crazy. It's mind-boggling to me. So thank you so much for this, and um, we look forward to hearing more. All right, um, we now will move into other reports. Um, Superintendent's report, Dr. Beresford. Still a little taken back by 2026. <laughs> yeah, freshman, 2026. Wow, that's a big number in my life. Um, but uh, no, I, I was a really good night here tonight. I really appreciated uh, that, uh, that. That graduation pie chart was pretty amazing. Uh, you know, almost 60% uh, doing advanced and then uh, I also thought the uh, I want to meet the kids that have the technical honors and the academic honors because uh, those guys have got to be busy. I mean that is the schedule. I don't know how they schedule that, but uh, so that's pretty amazing. And uh, uh, I, class twenty two is always going to be near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm proud of them. That just made me a little bit more proud of them. So that was good. Um, I'm going to try to set a record for the shortest uh, superintendent's report ever. And uh, but. Uh, I actually did, um, um, I always ask for the, the staff to um, evaluate me. And one of the people that wrote a little comment on my evaluation was that you're, he's pretty windy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you nailed it on that one. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to get better. Uh, but yeah, uh, this past weekend, you may have saw it, uh, I think it was posted on social media, but Lily Cooley is an incoming sixth grader at Clay. And she was recognized for her fundraising and leadership with the Arthritis Foundation. Now, Lily suffers from juvenile arthritis. And so some mornings it's really hard for her just to get out of bed uh, in, in a lot of pain. But she's decided to turn this negative into a positive, And she's dedicated herself for years now, uh, from when she was really, really little, um, to raising awareness and being a good role model for other youth with the disease. And uh, so much so that she was awarded the Don Haffley Award for Youth Leadership. Uh, Lily has raised more than $160,000 for the Arthritis Foundation and Peyton Manning's Children's Hospital. So, and uh, this is this is what uh, this Lily. She's grateful for her friends and her family at Mohawk Trails Elementary School, and moving on to Clay Middle School. And she's um, excited to get there with more new to meet new friends and also to, to hang with her older friends. And uh, I just want to say that we're real proud of her and we're grateful for her. Uh, secondly, I wanted to share um, that Carmel High School Associate Principal Karen McDaniel was nominated uh, and named to the National NASRO Governing Board as an educational representative. And uh, that's really a big deal. Uh, so I want to congratulate Mrs. McDaniel for that honor. And, uh, and while we're at it, I want to take just a moment to uh, thank and congratulate Carmel Police Officer DJ Sheff. And uh, I don't know if you do that or not, but DJ uh, served both the Vice President of NASRA, the National Organization of School Resource Officers, and the president. So for the last six years, he's been either the vice president or the president. And uh, he's now starting his term as the past president, uh, you know, for the next round. But we're real thankful for him and his dedication to students of Carmel Clay Schools, but also students across the country and in developing a super strong uh, school resource officer uh, standards and training and uh, just a whole philosophy of how that works in a positive way. And then my bell ringer is uh, we want all of our parents to be on the lookout for important back to school information. Uh, so watch your, watch your email, watch your, uh, all your sources of information. This is a great time for uh, parents to make sure all your contact information is correct in PowerSchool and Canvas. Uh, get on those computers, get on our website if you don't know how to do that. Uh, because when we're going to be we're going to bring, you're going to be getting all the, the information out about startup up of school. And if you, your, your information isn't up to date, that could, up to date, that could cause an issue. Uh, as you can guess, uh, this is a really busy time of the year. So watch out for important reminders and save the dates. Uh, we've got ice cream socials. We've got kindergarten meet and greets. Uh, they're all getting scheduled for our Greyhounds. We have, uh, we hope to see everyone back to welcome week, which is August 1st through 5th. There's a lot of action going on. I'm sure your kid's getting inundated by those. Um, there are great workshops planned for both parents and students. Uh, also, be sure to check out the Carmel High School website for all those details. And on August 5th, and uh, if you're, this is all for, for the freshmen, August 5th, we have the Greyhound Kickoff Mentor Program for incoming freshmen. And this is where freshmen are matched with upperclassmen and uh, they serve as their GCOM uh, person. And, uh, 
and it's just a great day full of activities. And the registration fee for that uh, is covers a t-shirt, lunch, and programming, and check out our website. And if there's a, anybody out there that has a financial need, we got you covered. So all you have to do is uh, inquire about financial assistance, and we'll get you covered. Nobody should, no freshman should not attend uh, the freshman orientation on, on account of money. Uh, we got you covered. We wanted all the freshmen, uh, we want to encourage all the incoming freshmen to try it out and try to make it because it'll greatly help your transition to high school. Um, and it's a great way to familiarize yourself with the building. You can practice your class schedule. You'll meet some teachers and some administrators. And of course, you're going to see your old friends and maybe make some new ones. So uh, that is my bell ringer for uh, the, the day. And uh, we have 15 weekdays before the student's first day, 15. So it's getting, we're getting in the zone to get excited and about 13 teacher days and uh, weekdays before teachers start showing up. So uh, it's getting exciting, it's getting real. So I'm uh, looking forward to get the 22-23 the school year started. And that concludes my report, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beresford. Thank you so much to our board members for being here tonight. It's a very exciting, very busy time for all of us. Um, not to put, you know, age us anymore, but the class of 2035 will be starting kindergarten this year. Yeah. So it is very exciting. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. I did the math too, so I could. But so tw the class of 2035 will be walking into kindergarten in a few weeks. So it is very exciting for us and for the district. We're so glad that um, everyone's here. Um, I wish you all a wonderful evening. And a, as you get started for the school year, do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Twenty thirty five, yeah.